This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. And I'm Ariana Brocious. Human-caused climate disruption is a collective crisis, and one that compounds the longer we don't address the root causes of it. But for so long, we've thought of it as a future problem, one that the next generation will solve. Totally. I've been covering climate for close to two decades, and it's only the fires, floods, and heat of the last few years that have caused climate to be perceived as a problem now, not off in the future. And let's face it, laying our hope for climate solutions at the feet of young people is not only unrealistic, it's completely unfair. Absolutely. From its earliest days, children and youth have been active in the climate movement, pushing older people in positions of power to admit they caused the problem and work to fix it. No one has made this point better than young activist Greta Thunberg, who calls out older generations for failing hers and not owning up to the problem they created while actively worsening the climate crisis through their inaction. Greta's frank and passion critiques and weekly climate protests made her famous. She was preceded by other youth activists like Slater Jewel Kemker. We need to address, as human beings, our sense of responsibility, and we need to address our selfishness. We need to rethink how we actually live and engage with each other and, and live with this planet, because this is how we've gotten into this, this monumental problem. As we'll hear about on today's show, years of tireless efforts fighting for change frequently leads to unrealistic expectations and even depression and burnout. I look back at it now and there is a part of me that is angry that the narrative encouraged me as a child to believe that I could fix the world's problems. Alec Lures was a celebrated youth climate activist years before anyone heard of Greta Thunberg. Starting from the time he was 12 years old, he dedicated his life to traveling all across the United States, educating other young people on the climate crisis, and inspiring them to take action through his organization, Kids vs. Global Warming. But at the age of 18, he fell into a deep depression and withdrew from the movement. His story is not uncommon. So many activists have burned out along the way, frustrated by participating in actions that very rarely lead to meaningful and lasting change. The emotional cost of seeing so little payoff for years spent fighting can be agonizing at any age, but perhaps more for young people who put so much of themselves into the effort. That said, some youth activists develop strategies for pushing through the burnout or avoiding it altogether. We'll talk to a couple of them later in the show. I met Alec Lures in 2011 when I interviewed him on the Climate One stage. I often wondered over the years what happened to him after he dropped out of the public eye. So I looked him up and I asked him to come back on the program to share the journey he's been on since that time and how he views the climate movement today. So Alec, thanks for coming back. When, when you were 12 years old, you watched An Inconvenient Truth with your mom. Of course, you were both profoundly impacted. She went up to bed. What happened for you? Um, well, I was blown away. I watched the whole movie again and all the special features and everything. I had never felt something like that, where I felt on, almost like a sense of calling to participate in raising awareness around this issue. And I felt a need to communicate with young people because we are the ones most affected. Um, I do still say we, even though I'm almost 30. <laughs> um, but that was my initial spark. I saw the movie, ended up doing more research, um, started getting invited to speak at events, and it kind of took off. That was when I was 12. Um, by the time I was 14, I was trained by Al Gore's program to give uh, a version of his slideshow. The youngest person ever at that point, which that title's now been usurped several times, which I'm very glad about. And then, yeah, through my, my teens, I had this really crazy lifestyle of traveling and speaking at conferences and doing interviews and all of this stuff, which was not what I expected. I didn't, I didn't start out trying to, to be a well-known public speaker or anything. I just wanted to share the, the news with members of my generation. Well, you, you had a calling after watching the movie. You kind of launched into this. And at the age of 12, you did become something of a rock star in the then very small climate movement. Here's a clip of you at age 13. I went to a big environmental conference, and while everyone was listening to all these important people speak, they set up a youth tent for all the youth to go. 
But that's not what we want, is it? It's not enough to be saying, yay, let's ride bikes and change light bulbs. No. We want to be in there with everyone else. What's it like to hear your 12-year-old self today? Man, it's it's a bit of a trip. <laughs> that was that was early. That was one of my first my first big speeches. Um and it's wild because I, I still agree with that point. <laughs> Everyone wants like a top 10 list of what are the simple actions we can take to stop global warming. And it's never going to be that simple. It's even a, a, a tactic of the fossil fuel industry to put the onus on consumers saying that it's, it's our consumption that's the problem. When really, our entire society is addicted to fossil fuels at every scale. And it's going to be worse and worse for us the longer we take to actually start easing away from that. Most 12-year-olds don't build their own PowerPoints and take to the national stage as you did. What was driving you then and what kept you going during those years when many people are just figuring out their identity, doing school? Yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely was interesting to be engaged in this through my adolescence. I think it, uh, it sort of took its toll on the way my identity was developing um, and at the same time, I did it because I, I felt like I needed to almost that there was there was a need within the world for people to be having this conversation and for a young person to be the one bringing bringing the science back again. And I really I guess I would go back to that sense of calling. It's something that stuck with me throughout the entire time. And I still feel and that's not something where I'm trying to say that I specifically have a have a calling to engage in the solution to climate change or whatever. And my point is that everyone is called to participate in this transition in some way, in their own way. And I, and that feeling is powerful. Um, it's something where I, I just started, I felt like I couldn't not do something. And I still feel like that. I, I haven't quite been out there on stage in <laughs> at least 10 years, uh, but my, my activism has taken a different form. And we'll, we'll get to that. But that level of notoriety and fame, and this is for people to remember, this is kind of social media was in a very different place at that time. And a lot of, you know, child actors that get famous young, they have real difficulty sort of navigating, you know, beyond that, like young, cute phase of their life into adolescence and, and what's next. And what was it like for you to kind of navigate that notoriety? It was difficult, <laughs> especially in my later teens, by the time I was 17, 18, um, I started feeling this sense of like there was a rift within my identity. There was the version of me that went on stage and spoke to an audience and was the climate change kid. And then I felt like my real self was something else that people didn't see. And I wasn't invited to share on stage. And I would like post things about music on my Facebook and get people saying, hey, what are you, what are you doing posting about music? This is not important. You're a climate change kid. They wanted you to be a certain way, right? Exactly. People had expectations of you that they then put on you. For sure. And I think that even taps into our culture's obsession with the hero's journey as an archetype of, of story, where a single individual hero goes out and discovers something and brings it back and, and is a hero. I think the culture is shifting away from that. I, I don't believe that that is the predominant myth for us right now, or at least it's it's falling apart and something else is emerging, which has to do with collectivity. The fact that we're all in this together, it's not ever going to be one person coming to save the world, that we have to save the world together. We have to work towards that. Some of the articles written about me back in the day were, were very much just sort of like, he's the next Al Gore, he's going to save us, which my ego loved to hear. But, the, but uh, at a certain point, it started feeling like, that's not what this is about. That's got to be quite a burden to have that yeah, thrust on you. When last you and I last talked, you were 16. You said then that when you were 12, you jumped right into action and that, that dread and despair of climate was just starting to hit you. Let's listen back to that moment from 12 years ago. When I first heard about climate change, when I first heard about this stuff, I, um, I just went straight to kind of doing something about it and, and taking action. And I skipped over, you know, despair and denial and stuff. And it's just kind of taken till the last couple of months to, to hit to kind of hit that that space and been struggling with it a little bit. So what was that going on? What was your struggle then? Yeah, last couple of months. That is interesting to hear. 16. I think that was the point when I started maybe becoming a little bit cynical about the the tactics of the mainstream climate movement. I mean, I'd only been engaged for several years, but just talking to people who'd been part of this movement for decades leading up to then and just this realization that like 
my God, what are we doing? We're trying the same tactics over and over and over again, expecting different results. And at the same time, I, I realized that it's, uh, what else are we going to do? I think a lot of people within the climate space know that continuing to do marches and writing petitions and writing a letter to your congressman and stuff, it's like, if that was going to work, it would have worked by now. Sure. So yeah, and since we last talked, you know, I've learned from Renee Lertzman, who's a psychologist who works on eco-anxiety, that people try to push their feelings aside and then act because they feel the urgency of climate. Those feelings don't go away. They just grow <laughs> and fester and then come back and, and grab you by the ankles or the throat sometime later. But a lot of people, I think what you were talking about there is, you know, don't feel, just jump in, do, because, you know, the planet's, our home's on fire do something. And some people think that that activity will yeah, make the despair go away. But it sounds like it did a little bit for you. I was able to not go there, I think, for the first several years, even though I knew how, how treacherous of a situation it was, I just sort of was able to focus in on, okay, I'm doing what I can, and it's going to be okay. I think uh, definitely in the in the years since then, I've as I've reflected, it's my perspective now is probably a little bit different. I feel like those emotions are extremely important to express and to work with. Um, and the fact that eco uh, anxiety is like a term now, I think speaks to the fact that so many people are feeling this sense of, of, of dread. And by the time you were 18, you wanted a new identity. You said you started to kind of get cynical about the movement, got depressed that progress wasn't happening, same tactics being tried. You moved to a new school in British Columbia. Tell us about that kind to step away and reinvent yourself. Yeah, I reached a point when I was 18 where I was kind of just done with that world. It was just exhausting and so difficult for my for my internal self to be mostly just the travel was so was so intense. Certain months I was traveling for three weeks out of the month. There was one Earth Day where I spoke in 11 different cities, took a flight in between each one within a single week. Uh, and there were always film crews coming to our house and just sort of always another event to prepare for. So that was part of it. And and the the cynicism about the movement was part of it too. This sort of sense of, okay, this isn't working. I've, I don't know if I, I if it's worth trying to convince everyone else that we should try something else. So I'm going to just try something else. And for me, what that looked like was just stepping aside, taking taking a big step back. I moved to Canada, went to school in BC, made a new Facebook page that I, I invited new friends to and didn't mention anything about my climate background. I felt wounded by that. And so I kind of just wanted to to let it go. It's like you shed out a skin. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And that became its own sort of difficulty of just connecting with friends and then only like never telling them about the thing. And someone would randomly like come across an old TEDx talk that I did and be like, what, what, what? you did this? And just this feeling of like that, that sense of calling never actually went away. The feeling that I needed to do something about this, maybe even intensified. Um, and that sort of came to a head in 2014, after I'd been at that school for two years. Um, the campus was up in the mountains in, in British Columbia, north of Vancouver, surrounded by like old growth forest with a, a river running through it and a waterfall and just gorgeous. And that spring, 2014, the gravel company that owned the land came and started clear cutting the forest in a really brutal way. And like I went out there and watched it um, and was just heartbroken. And just as bad was the fact that none of the other people at the school really seemed to care that much. There wasn't really any sort of a sense that this wasn't okay. Where for me, it was like gut-wrenchingly not okay. Um, and just the realization that like, my God, now that I've witnessed it, I could visualize so much more vividly what's going on in the Amazon, what's going on throughout Canada. The last remaining forests are being, are being cut for profit. Um, so anyway, that was that was really intense. That's sort of one of the things that kicked off my summer of the deepest depression. I sort of ended up taking another step back <laughs> that year, went and traveled across the country, worked on organic farms as a way to just connect with the land. Um, and that ended up becoming my main focus. Um, by 2016, I'd settled in Olympia, Washington. Um, over the next couple of years, I started spending more and more time with shorelines and parks and places that were wild and alive. In 2018, I um, 
discovered a stretch of shoreline in Olympia, Washington that I literally fell in love with. I went out there with my cameras doing time lapse photography and I would be I would stay out there for eight hours straight or twelve hours some days. I would I would go early in the morning and stay till dusk, time lapsing and writing and being there and witnessing birds and animals and watching the tide lower and rise and had some really significant encounters with wild creatures um, that I'm working on writing, writing out as stories because my sense throughout that whole time was that it's not just for me that I'm going, I'm not just trying to go and have fun at a pretty place. This is, this is an act of reconnecting with the wildness that has been so um, devastated by human civilization and trying to learn how to listen, how to hear those voices, how to see these places of the beings who inhabit them as alive and intelligent and worthy of being valued and even entering into conversation with. They don't speak in words, but they're still speaking. So nature, you, you connected with nature and that, that, that healed you. Yes. And I, I deeply believe that that is the only way we are going to get out of this mess is by returning to the greater world and realizing that all the answers are out there. The, the earth knows how to stay in balance. We just need to find a way to align with that balance. You're listening to a Climate One conversation with youth climate activists. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. Coming up, Alec lures on the value of connection he's learned living close to nature and how that applies to the climate crisis. Something that's given me a lot of hope for the future is the idea of permaculture. The idea that we can build a human presence that is enduring and that is integrated with the wider landscape. That's up next when Climate One continues. Youth climate activist Alec Lures wasn't alone in his efforts. He had his mother, Victoria Lures, with him the whole way. She recalls how passionate her son became after watching An Inconvenient Truth. The next day he was on fire. He had built his own little presentation. He was going to go to his class. He was in seventh grade. And uh, he was going to tell them we're going to stop global warming. Victoria supported her son's new conviction. She ended up quitting her corporate job to travel with him, handling organizing and fundraising while he gave his climate presentations. They did that full time for seven years. And parents would ask me, like, how did you get your kid to do this? Like, you obviously don't have a teenager because you don't get teenagers to do things. Like, you support what they are <laughs> already passionate about. And so it was his passion that uh, I was supporting all along. And they had to navigate the stardom and pressure that came with it, which could be tough for a teenager. You know, and sometimes his ego would, would get in the way, and we'd talk about it and go, you know, this isn't about you. And, and he got that. Victoria recalls some leaders tried to protect her son and other youth activists from the full picture of the climate emergency, even as they welcomed their role in the movement. During the Earth Day 40th anniversary celebration on the National Mall, she was backstage and overheard three people talking, including famed climate scientist Jim Hansen and Bobby Kennedy Jr. They were discussing how the planet had just crossed a critical tipping point. And as they were talking about it, Alec walked up and all three of them stopped talking and, you know, changed the subject completely, waited till Alec was gone. And then I heard them, you know, just kind of say, the young people, you know, they were protecting him from what is real. And I understand that, um, wanting to do that. I understand that as a parent, wanting to protect ourselves, our own hearts, our children from the reality that is coming, that is here, <laughs> that we are in. But I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure how helpful that is. Along the way, Victoria and Alec formed an organization to help inspire and activate more youth in the climate movement. Youth like the young Swede Greta Thunberg, who rose to prominence years later by calling out hypocrisy and inaction at the United Nations. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet 
I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Alec was never like Greta, where she'll just name it and just say, you know, you guys screwed up and we're stuck with it. Like, he would never say that. That's just not his heart. His heart is much more collaborative and understanding where people are coming from. But those same feelings did resonate for Alec, Victoria says, after he started to become disillusioned with the lack of progress on climate and the scale of the crisis. When he went to uh, Iceland and actually saw how much the glaciers had receded. He could feel it in his body and the grief began. That was really, I think, a turning point for him when he could actually feel it and it wasn't just a message. Victoria went on to found the Center for Wild Spirituality and write a book entitled Church of the Wild, How Nature Invites Us into the Sacred. She has this advice for parents of other youth activists. I would say, listen, honor them. Almost makes me cry. (laughs) They know why they're here. They know this is important. You can support them. You know, diminishing this doesn't help. Exaggerating it doesn't help. Giving them ways to be active. Learning from them. <laughs> you know, in a way, they're, they're closer to the earth. They haven't forgotten as much as we have. So that's what I would say. <laughs> be present with them. They're going to need you. In talking with adult Alec Lures, I asked him if he felt any guilt after stepping back from the climate movement when he was younger. A little bit. Um, it's sort of it's sort of complicated within myself because I was just so ready to to be done with it when I initially stepped back. Um, but I guess you could call it guilt. This this sense that started building of like the longer that I stayed away, it sort of was like, yeah, I guess there was a bit of a of a disappointment in myself. And at the same time, there was a sense of I'm still searching for what what the actual answers are. I haven't actually stepped back. Really, I've stepped back from public speaking and doing interviews and stuff. But it's, uh, it's still almost obsessively what I think about all the time is climate change. Do you miss this public spotlight in any way? I don't miss being put on a pedestal and talked about as the hero. What I do miss is being on stage, speaking to an audience who is vibing with what I'm saying, to feel that sense of connection with people who are, who are getting something for the first time that I, that I recently got for the first time, and this being able to share it with people and feeling that connection with, with people in the, in the audience. When you were 12, the world was on track for maybe five or six degrees of Celsius of warming. You were really affected by... NASA scientist James Hansen saying that we had only five years to make significant progress, and a lot of progress has been made. We're now on track for two and a half, maybe a little more degrees of warming since the Industrial Revolution. Still bad, but not as bad as it was, say, a decade ago. How do you think about the progress that has been made, the good news? It it is good news. Um, I'm, I'm trying to hold back my cynicism. So I don't know if I truly believe that we're on track for two and a half to three degrees Celsius. But even if we are, that's still a really scary world. And I think we have to be prepared for the the types of weather disasters that we've been seeing just to intensify and become more common and more prolonged and more intense. But I, I'm I'm trying to find a way to hold both of, of feeling this sense of progress is being made. The right types of conversations are happening at a high level, at least the beginning stages of those conversations. And there does seem to be a commitment within countries to actually address this problem. I I don't know if the actual tactics that are being discussed are actually going to fully get us out of this mess. And it's also one thing to commit to something, and it's a whole other thing to actually do it. Nations have been committing to climate targets for at least 20 years and consistently not reaching them. So something still has to kick into gear at that higher political level. And Partly my, my perspective now is that we shouldn't wait until the politicians and UN people figure this out for us, that it takes addressing this in all of our own ways. 
And so how do you describe your life now? Well, at this point, I'm living on, on a former farm in southern Ontario. Um, in 2021, I, I moved out here from Washington State to be with Slater Jewel Kemker, who is now my wife. We got married last year. She's also, she was involved in the climate movement back when I was, and we almost met so many times back in the day, but we only connected in 2019. So we've been living together for the last two years. And we like planted a food forest with some friends who, who live close by. We've got probably 20 different garden spaces, doing a lot of um, work generating the soil, building up biomass. As I've learned more, agriculture is a huge part of the difficulty of the situation we're in. I think the longer that we stick to the modern sort of monocrop industrial agriculture, the more difficult it's going to be to actually feed everyone properly. And I think so many people are longing to return to the land in this way, to grow our own food, to make our own energy, to be in community. That's what we're striving for here. And actually something that's given me a lot of hope for the future is the idea of permaculture. The idea that we can build a human presence that is enduring and that is integrated with the wider landscape rather than making a farm by clearing away what's there and planting a bunch of corn. We can only get through this together. We're past the phase of individual people being the solution. And I think it doesn't have to be the other extreme of like mass movement type stuff. I do still think there's a there's a space for that, especially if it can be coordinated in a higher level way rather than like this group's going to do a march and then it's over. This group does a march and then it's done. Like I think we as a movement need to be having this conversation of how do we integrate our efforts and find like an overarching strategy that is common um, but then decentralized organizing within that. I think that's the type of thing that that's going to be really powerful as as it as it's explored more and more throughout the next few years. Alec Lures is a climate activist, writer, and photographer. I interviewed more than a decade ago when you were twelve. Thank you for coming back and sharing your story so candidly and openly and vulnerably, Alec. I think a lot of people can relate. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much for having me back on. It's a pleasure. You're listening to a conversation about youth climate activists. Coming up, how one young person found her place in the climate movement by documenting it. Okay, I'm not going to be the kid necessarily who goes and, you know, chains himself to a reactor fence. I'm not going to be the kid who goes and, um, like, stages some crazy publicity stunt. But I can be the person who goes and film them because no one was paying attention to kids at that time. No one was, was taking them seriously. That's up next. This is Climate One. I'm Ariana Brocious. A powerful way to experience the life of a youth climate activist is to watch the documentary Youth Unstoppable, it was produced by Slater Jewel Kemker, who spent more than a decade filming and documenting the work of youth climate activists while being one herself. Like her now husband Alec Lures, Slater stepped away from the movement and has found a new sense of peace investing in her life focused on permaculture and sustainable living in rural Ontario. I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, California, and my parents were in the film industry. And most of their friends and the people in our life were involved in media or arts, but with a very specific bent of wanting to make the world a better place. One of our dear friends, Jeannie Meyer, started this organization called the My Hero Project um, in the very kind of infancy of the internet because she wanted her kids to have somewhere to go online that was safe and inspiring and made humanity feel a little bit more uh, worth saving, even at that time. Um, and when I was little, uh, a friend of ours, Kathy Eldon, uh, she was going to go interview the peace activist Ron Kovic for My Hero. And uh, I went along with my mom and he would only give an interview to me. So I was five years old and holding this camera and he put me on his lap and wheeled me around his apartment and showed me all of his anti-war pro-peace artworks and, and told me about his experiences and I think it just it, it clicked um, something in my brain clicked at that young age of, oh, this is normal. I can talk to anyone I want. I can uh, ask them questions because, you know, it's always no until you ask. And 
it, it, it just felt like that was something that I could do in my life. Um, no one had told me yet that, oh, you're five years old. You can't just go and interview people. So I, I think that just <laughs> stuck with me. So you had an early interest in filmmaking. You had role models in your life that were filmmakers. But why choose to do something documenting climate activists? When I was about nine years old, I moved up with my family to a farm in southern Ontario in Canada. And going from a very small uh, house and yard in the valley in Los Angeles to um, fields and woods and rivers and fireflies and animals and just this magic sense of wonder really reprogrammed my brain as to what joy was in my life as to what um, safety felt. And this made me get more and more interested in the environment because it was something that people were talking about and, and writing articles about and um, something was going wrong. And through the My Hero Project and my parents and my uh, love of filmmaking and newfound interest in the environment, I was given the opportunity to interview Jean-Michel Cousteau, um, the son of Jacques Cousteau, the renowned marine bio biologist. And it was the first time in my life that I spoke to an adult of that level, of that um, immense wisdom and knowledge and like social standing in the world who fully communicated with me, even though I was a kid, even though I wasn't anywhere near his level of, of uh, knowledge on the subject. He spoke to me as a fellow human being and that I felt like my questions to him mattered, that he genuinely wanted to interact with me. And, and he was so kind and lovely and was really the one who I guess, kind of inspired me to go on this journey. He he literally passed me a baton and said, it's your job now. And I, I feel like a lot of kids would say, I maybe wouldn't run with that, maybe wouldn't take it seriously, but I took it very seriously uh, because this person respected me and I respected them and I felt like I could do something. No one had told me at that point yet that I that I couldn't. Um, so I started getting more involved, and that led me to representing Canada as a youth delegate at uh, the Environmental G8 Summit in Japan in 2008. I'd like to jump in there because there's a moment in your film where you talk about this, where you felt like for the first time kids weren't being taken seriously. And I want to hear this moment from you. You're 15 years old. You're at the G8 Summit in Japan. This is in 2008. It was just really surreal going on the stage because I felt like we were acts. And when they called out the country's names, some of the ministers cheered and stuff. And it made me feel like they were just doing that to seem like they were buddy-buddy with the youth of tomorrow. Well, I felt like we were just like the photo op kids. So what were you feeling in that moment? Explain that feeling of sort of being used as props. And was that something that became common as you continued to be a youth climate activist? Wow, it's been a, it's been a minute since I've heard that scene. <laughs> um, I, was, I was 15 years old. I was, I was in this very uh, like small, intense period of time where there were about 100 other young people from around the world. And we were all in this space working together because we were uh, there under the impression that we would be actually collaborating and working with our with our environmental ministers and with our leaders and that we would have a say in our own lives, that we would be able to actually influence policy and and participate in a meaningful way. And some of the stuff that I when I think about it now that we were talking about even now is still. I guess, kind of radical, but hits right to the point of this climate crisis of this this existential crisis of, okay, we need to address as human beings our sense of responsibility and we need to address our selfishness. We need to rethink how we actually live and engage with each other and and live with this planet because this is how we've gotten into this this monumental problem. This is what is killing people every year and impacting all of our lives. And I was so proud and so inspired by 
you know, these other kids who were also my friends. Uh, we became such fast friends. Uh, my friend Abrar from Bangladesh, and I remember him telling me about how, you know, the floods in his country had been getting worse every year, every year, and that he would be walking through the city streets um, waist deep or higher in water and how you'd have to just keep going about your day and trying to be okay. And when this this moment happened, when we were finally were going to be interacting with our ministers, it really was just a photo op. And, you know, at the time, it was the first time of my realizing that, oh, these these leaders, these ministers aren't necessarily these gods of morality who want to uh, make everything OK and have our best interests at heart, that they they, too, are human beings with flaws and with preconceived notions and very much only viewed us as um, as eye candy to be used for their benefit. Our words were stripped down. They were made stupid. Uh, it was incredibly shocking. I, I couldn't believe it. And it was only the kids from the G8 countries who actually got to go and interact with their ministers. Um, so Brar didn't go. My friend from Indonesia didn't go. My friend from Nepal didn't go. So basically all the countries from the global south were not represented or there at all. And it just it felt gross to me. And I, I think I've become a little bit more slightly jaded with time because that just kept happening again and again and again and again. And that was what got me on this journey of this documentary. That's what got me on this journey of being a, a climate activist was that I felt like, okay, I'm not going to be the kid necessarily who goes and, you know, chains himself to a reactor uh, fence. I'm not going to be the kid who goes and um, <laughs> like stages some crazy publicity stunt, but I can be the person who goes and film them because no one was paying attention to kids at that time. No one was, was taking them seriously. And, and I felt like, it, you know, I'm here, I'm willing, I'm going to just do it. And it must have been frustrating to feel that sort of lack of power, lack of agency, especially after having this really, you know, profound interaction with Cousteau, who had sort of given you the license to pursue question asking and, you know, pursuit of the truth. And I'm wondering how you sort of handled that feeling in the moment and how much that inspired you to continue this project of this evolving documentary that you had started. Being in that moment in Japan of seeing my new friends who were, even though they were young, were the smartest people in the room, were the most empathetic, kind, and thoughtful people in the room, not being listened to, made me extremely angry. At first, I was very depressed and sad, but it then changed into this, this deep anger and this sense of astonishment that... that you know, these these kids who are going to be inheriting this world from our leaders were were not being taken seriously. They weren't even listening to them. And and I I took that anger and I I decided that, you know, I needed to go find these other kids who were as impassioned as I was, because even though this was such a meaningful experience, pretty much Abra, my friend Abra and I were maybe the some of the only ones who kept going because it was so unsettling um, to go and put your heart and soul into something and work so hard and then to not be taken seriously. So many kids just backed away. And that became a cycle that I saw again and again over the years going to UN climate talks of, of kids going in wholehearted and optimistic and young and happy and not being able to deal with it, with the rejection. Roughly what percentage would you say of the people within that cohort that you started in, in with in the early 2000s, 2010s are still activists today? Maybe 10%, 15%. So what does that say, that there's it's, a high uh, rate of burnout? Yeah. It definitely says that there's a high rate of burnout. Because when you, when you take a step back and you look at what we're actually dealing with, we've been having these uh, climate change conferences since you know, the first one was uh, took place three days before I was born. And there is this overwhelming sense of urgency and need that has been there, but maybe kicked to the side over the decades. And young people feel it more, I think, than a lot of other parties feel it more than their leaders, because this is very much going to be 
impacting their world and their future and their life. Maybe we thought at the time it was going to impact our kids or our grandkids more, and we're now very well aware that it's impacting our lives too. But when you go to these spaces, usually they take place where all of the leaders and presidents and whatnot are. It's it's very um, opulent and separate and and uh, refined and uh until Paris, um, all of the the youth climate activists and NGOs and um, other parties were kind of relegated to a random warehouse type environment that was nearby, but not too close. And it could be really dehumanizing to be in those spaces uh, where you're talking about the very fundamentals of life, of what it means to be a human, of what it means to uh have a community to have an identity that is being that is being threatened by climate change particularly if you're in the global south of having ancestors who are buried in this place and have been for centuries and you won't be able to live there anymore you'll have to leave the US or powerful countries coming in with 300 negotiators who can be at every single meeting they want to be at and then you have the real stakeholders only have one negotiator because that's all they can afford and they get easily overwhelmed and can only go to certain ones. And so they aren't really there with the voice. And so it's incredibly depressing to see that year after year, without fail, the one thing that you can count on is that the climate crisis is getting worse, that we're seeing it more and more, that people are dying, that people are are losing their livelihoods. And it feels like the people in charge who have the power to make real change are in a completely different reality. And, and it's very difficult. It's very hard. And then you come home and most people have never heard of a COP or the UN climate change conferences. And, and you feel like you're in this weird sense of, of like, am I just screaming at a wall? Am I screaming into the void? Like, can no one else see this? Am I insane? Um, it's hard when the people that you love don't necessarily understand what you're doing. It's hard to see how everything that you thought was going to happen is coming to pass like some horrible prophecy and people are still coming up with the same ideologies and ideas and ways forward and solutions as they were 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. That is why there is a huge rate of burnout. Well, what is your relationship with climate activism now? Mm -hmm. I like to think that um, I can be a person who can go to the current kind of crop of youth climate activists and and help them in this in this hard time and and remind them of where they came from. That it really truly is another example of of you're able to do what you're doing because of thirty years of other youth climate activists fighting to even be able to be allowed to speak at the UN of, of being in these positions of being the first one to sue the U S government of being like all these kids have been fighting this fight. Oh, like I always think of Severin Kula Suzuki at 12 years old in 1992 in Rio. You teach us to not to fight with others, to work things out to respect others, to clean up our mess, not to hurt other creatures, to share, not be greedy. Then why do you go out and do the things you tell us not to do? Do not forget why you are attending these conferences, who you're doing this for. We are your own children. You are deciding what kind of a world we are growing up in. I still get that video sent to me like, oh, wow, look at this girl. We have to support her. And it's like, this is from 30 years ago. So I think particularly with this documentary and my experiences of way too many burnt out nights of the soul, um, I, I, I feel like I have something to offer when I meet with when I meet with young people and I meet with kids who are starting out at the same age I did and, and telling them that it's OK to not be a crazy activist robot. Uh, when I was a youth climate activist, like I was embarrassed that I felt burnt out. I was I was embarrassed that I was feeling overwhelmed when really what I should have been doing was was looking 
towards my friends and my community and, and talking to them about it. But I felt like if I took a step away, I was letting down the movement. And then I realized years later that everyone else felt the same way. What would you say to the younger you in this climate activism space? Oh, wow. I think uh, if I was to talk to the younger me, uh, one of the most important things that I could say would be to, and I understand saying this, that there is a certain degree of privilege, but to say, to not, um, to not be so hard on myself. I, I look back at it now and there is a part of me that is angry that the narrative encouraged me as a child to believe that I could fix the world's problems. And that led to years of struggling with anxiety and depression and perfectionism and wondering you know, I was putting my all in. Why wasn't, why weren't things getting better? I was just not working hard enough. And I grieve for my child self thinking that I could make it all better. But it is a fallacy to think that a child can fix this problem when we're looking at hundreds of years of systemic injustice and hundreds of years of convenience and consumerism over the health of people and the planet and and money. I think there needs to be a lot more kindness. There needs to be a lot more uh, empathy and compassion and listening. And I think we need to acknowledge that maybe we can't win the climate battle the way that we thought we could, the way that we were told that we could. It actually is really meaningful to try to change your community and where you live and where you are, that that does make a difference, I think. Even if it's just for people to feel like they are maybe living in a better way. I've, I've really come to this place in my life where I feel like that is also important. Slater Jewel Kemker is a filmmaker and climate activist. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us on Climate One. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Abrar Anwar has experienced the impacts of climate disruption his whole life. A U.S. citizen, he grew up in Bangladesh, a country he describes as unbelievably beautiful, but beset by climate-induced severe storms, flooding, tidal surges, and more. I was around 11 or 12 years old, and we were going to renew my passport. And the top of our car went underwater as we approached the embassy. We had to get out. We had to wade through almost hip-high water and get there. And right next to the U.S. Embassy, like, say, the end of the same street, there was one of the largest slums in the area. And, like, you got to the embassy and you saw all these cars pulling up into this lovely dry space. And you would look around and you would see people having to pull their belongings, their clothes, onto floating pieces of wood and pull it out of the slum uphill towards somewhere where it's drier. He got into the climate movement when he was 16, thanks to his involvement in his school's debate team. There was a debate competition about the environment. And so to prep for this debate, I started doing my research on environmental problems in Bangladesh. And what I found shocked and horrified me to my core. From then on, I've been trying to get my voice heard in as many places as possible. And luckily, uh, I got to go to the G8 Climate Summit by the time I was uh, almost 18 and actually saw like how vast and amazing the youth climate movement was and how dedicated these children were, me being a child myself at the time. And it really gave me hope and pushed me a lot further into uh, becoming a climate activist. So I returned from Japan very inspired and I participated in two or three environmental groups here to help in cleanups and in or, in organizing some more sustainable electricity sources for people in the villages and helped my friend start the Lal Shobuj Foundation, which to this day, they're heavy into the environmental activism scene here, doing cleanups, road cleanups, tree planting, uh, marches, conferences and everything. Um, and it's entirely youth led. So we phase out as we grow older. Those of us that live in industrialized, wealthy countries know 
sort of uh, intellectually that there are people in developing nations that are being hit now, have been hit first and worst by climate disasters, but it's still another thing to actually see it and then yet another to live it or experience it personally. How do you make this crisis real for people who aren't living it the way you are? We're a more interconnected society today than we were 20 years ago. We saw in the war in Ukraine for the first time that people could go live on the ground in affected areas and show us what their lives are like. And it really woke a lot of people up. People who had no investment or stake started helping out. The climate movement, while it has been leveraging that, I think people in affected areas themselves need to be reaching out more instead of news channels broadcasting it for their audience. There need to be live streams from our government. There need to be people going into affected areas across the world to show everyone exactly what's happening here. And I think a look at the ground level view of how people are living through these climate disasters would actually open a lot of other people's eyes. So you transitioned from climate activism to working in sustainable tech. Do you think you've avoided the burnout that so many of your peers experienced from being youth climate activists? To an extent, yes. Now, there are times I, I'm still on the ground, especially because I'm in a country where this kind of disasters are happening regularly. So you can never really count yourself out. Uh, but I have definitely seen the burnout from not being heard, screaming and speaking to the same policymakers over and over again, the transition from being youth to being an adult and still not being heard and still fighting in the same movement and not knowing whether you've gained an inch or not. It's been a really big burnout on a lot of my friends that I know. How do you think you um, avoided that? I'm not saying I did, but to an extent, um, being a father helps because giving up at that point is not an option. The next generation is here. Like we were the youth climate activists. There is a new generation of them now. We've got kids of our own that are inheriting the world next. I think that really helped with me staying focused, but I wouldn't say I've avoided the burnout. I felt the depression. I felt the crash. I've seen my friends get arrested and hosed down and taken away by cops and have had to bail some of them out or shelter some of them through issues like that. And it's definitely taken a toll. There were days where getting up and working didn't seem like an option. And I have to say, maybe it's just taking a deep breath and realizing the world is still incredibly beautiful. Like we have not lost everything we're fighting to save. And there's very beautiful people out there. We're trying to make it a better place even now. And I think eventually when you see what everyone else is doing, you yourself come back into it and it helps you get back on your feet and go, no, every little bit still does count. Everyone's still trying. Abrar Anwar is a former youth climate activist and chief technology officer at Rebel Force Tech Solutions. We also spoke with Kyle Gracie, another youth activist highlighted in Slater Jewel Kemker's film, Youth Unstoppable. I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania that was sort of coal country, and my family had worked in coal. So that was my first exposure to fossil fuels. But what happened in, I think it was around high school, is they started building wind turbines in the county next to me. And so those started becoming a thing that people were talking about. And there were literally places up in the hills in Pennsylvania where you could look one direction and see wind turbines and look behind you and see coal mines. And so it was just this kind of wild visual of sort of the past and the future uh, of energy. And so around that time, I, as I was learning about that, I was also learning about this thing called climate change and just making the connections between those two and getting concerned about it. I'd like to play a moment of this clip from you. This was filmed at COP15, the United Nations climate negotiations in Copenhagen in 2009, uh, when you were 24. So right here, we're basically trying to ensure that a really strong deal comes out of the climate negotiations, working with a lot of international youth from around the world in solidarity on the same issues and trying to push for strong climate action. I just want to share the passion of youth and understand that we're here, we're ready, we're involved, and we're just going to get bigger. We're not just here to say that when we get older that we, we tried. We think that we can have an impact and we won't stop 
until we see the clean energy future that we all want. So that was nearly 15 years ago, and that particular COP was notoriously a bit of a bust. There was not a strong deal (laughs) that resulted from those negotiations. What is it like to hear that now? I think it still tracks for me, you know, the the focus on not just being there uh, either as a spectator, like some people were, or just wanting to try, but actually really being focused and believing that that we could have an impact. Copenhagen wasn't much of a success, but over the longer period of time, we have had successes. Young people around the world have been successful in moving the needle uh, on climate action. What I aspired to do at that moment is what we actually went on to do, to bring the power of young people to the climate negotiations, to influence decision makers, to be more future focused and future generations focused, and to take the entire issue more seriously with their actions and their words than I think they otherwise would have. You said in that clip, we won't stop until we see the clean energy future that we want. Did you stop? Did you face burnout? I did not stop. Um, I continued to work in climate. I still work in climate for at least part of my work today. I didn't personally experience burnout, but I was definitely around lots of folks who went through different periods of burnout many of them actually because of Copenhagen. There was a lot of burnout right after Copenhagen. Um, But fortunately, I was able to avoid that and keep the momentum going for myself long after that. So tell me what tools and strategies you use to, to help yourself cope and not maybe experience the same level that some of your peers did. One is I tried to be realistic about what the potential outcomes could be. So some of the reasons that people got burned out of Copenhagen was because there was this big narrative built out that it was going to be the solution to the climate crisis. And so then when that didn't happen and and when it failed so spectacularly, people were just disillusioned because they had expected that that was going to be everything. And I never expected it. I expected that it would be at best, you know, incremental progress. And at worst, no progress. Uh, and it was some ended up being somewhere in between. I try to have kind of a healthy level of of making change, but recognizing that change can take a long time. So that's been the biggest one. And then, you know, just taking care of myself, good self-care, you know, eating well, exercising, sleeping, all the things that people talk about for maintaining good resilience. And then just thinking carefully about why I got into this in the first place and being focused on that action. Uh, orientation, being focused on creating change and remembering that that's why I'm here and that I'm planning to do that my whole life. And so if I have to focus on this issue my whole life to get there, that's fine. And if I get there sooner than that, that's great. There's lots of other challenges in the world that I can work on too. Kyle Gracie is a strategy consultant with Future Matters. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Thank you. We've heard a range of perspectives today from youth climate activists who are now young adults. We asked each of them to share their advice to the youth getting involved in climate today. My advice would be to be a little more radical than we have been. Try and shake up the system. Governments don't like disruption. Shut down the road in front of your parliament. Organize marches. But not just that. Get yourself into positions of power. Aim for places where you can stand toe to toe with lobbyists, with policymakers, with people who are influencing big oil, big energy. Get yourself in a position to be heard and making sure once you're in that position, you don't back down and you don't change your opinions based on the pressure you will be feeling from your peers at the time. You are going to feel depressed. You are going to feel overwhelmed and it's okay to take a step back and to heal because you'll You won't be able to continue this work if you just keep pushing on. My biggest advice is to build community. We are not going to solve any of these problems by ourselves. These are complex, interconnected challenges, uh, and we need an entire society of people to, to do that effectively. So creating connections among other people working together on this and what what we sort of call never worrying alone, never being stuck 
thinking that you're the only person who's taking on this challenge and recognizing that the reason it feels hard is because it is hard. It's a big, complex thing that we're trying to to shift in the world, but it can be done. People have, have changed the world before and young people have changed the world before and they can do it again. Trust your authority as a young person who will be impacted by this, this crisis. And remember that it's not about you, that this is something collective. We, we are tapping into something that's bigger than us with having these conversations and engaging in this work. That was Abrar Anwar, Slater Jill Kemker, Kyle Gracie, and Alec Lors. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. Talking about climate can be hard, as we heard today, and it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. It helps people discover the show. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. On our new website, climateone.org, you can create and share playlists focused on any topic. Ariana Brocious is co-host, editor, and producer. Brad Marsland is our senior producer. Managing director is Jenny Park. Austin Cologne is producer and editor. Our production manager is Megan Basilia. Wensi Shade is our development manager. Ben Testani is our communications manager. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy and Philip Yun are co-CEOs of the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.